Welcome back to the Health Tech Crew podcast. I'm your host, Igor Gorlotov, and today we've got a healthcare heavyweight in the house, Andrew Lovewell. Currently serving as the CEO of Columbia Orthopedic Group, Andrew is a master of juggling various revenue lines while pushing the envelope in healthcare technology. He's not just a CEO. He is also an adjunct professor at Central Methodist University and a self-proclaimed data analytics black belt. Andrew's got the track record for turning healthcare centers into powerhouses. Case in point, the surgical center at Columbia Orthopedic Group ranked at the seventh best ambulatory surgery center in the US under his leadership. He's a vocal advocate against antitrust violations in healthcare and is passionate about driving change through innovation and collaboration. Today, we'll dig into his secrets for balancing role uh, roles, his take on the state of healthcare and how he's integrating cutting edge uh, tech like robotic assisted surgery into his workflow. Plus, we'll get his thoughts on the future of healthcare and what book he's currently reading. Trust me, you'll want to stick around on this one. Hi, Andrew. Thank you so much for joining me on the Health Tech Group podcast. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Igor. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Me too. I'm super excited. And my first question is, uh, you are curr you currently serve as the CEO for Columbia Orthopedic Group with various revenue lines. So how do you manage to balance all those roles? Yeah, so, so I've been in this role for just over a year now. Luckily, I've got a really, really great team uh, that kind of helps support all of our ancillary service lines um, within our organization. So we have within inside of Columbia Orthopedic Group, we've got, like you said, several different revenue or ancillary lines. We've got an imaging center, a retail pharmacy, uh, a braces and orthotics or DME company. We also have, you know, the real estate. We own all of our own real estate. All of our operations, you know, are in one building with the exception of a couple satellite clinics that we have. So um, got a great big operation here, and it really takes you know a great team of staff and and managers and um, leaders to run this. So, you know, luckily for me, that's that's the way I manage it is just having really good people. And uh, in terms of specifically balancing, do you have to balance, or kind of it works organically for you? No, there's balance. There's balance <laughs> everything in life, right? Like everything in moderation. Um, yeah, so there's definitely balance. So for me, you know, I try to uh, strategically work on just a few areas at a time for improvement and opportunities. But unfortunately, that you know, the, the plate gets full pretty quickly. So um, I try to balance as much as I can. Now, I would say that sometimes that just varies based on, you know, what's going on or um, what hot regulatory or, or Medicare CMS thing pops up. Um, you know, like when I, when I took the role originally, our, our durable medical equipment was really, really dramatically impacted because Medicare CMS came out with um, a bunch of guidelines related to how braces, orthotics, um, HA injections, how those things are paid, how now there's pre-cert that has to be required to put a brace on somebody. Um, so a lot of my focus was shifted to that, you know, making sure that we're um, running a, a very efficient uh, revenue cycle, but also taking care of patients. So um, the balance there was really lopsided towards one of our ancillary lines. And, and you know, that shifted because of external forces. It wasn't an internal thing, but externally. So um, the nice thing is there's there's ebbs and flows, right? So like I can get in the weeds on one one part of our business one day and then the next day I'm I'm thinking about something totally different that is is way outside the box. So um, there's definitely a balance. Um, there's also a balance, you know, with ma maintenance, internally maintaining our business, but also then growing our business because the way things work in the private practice is you know, it all comes down to maintenance, but also growth and sustainability and how all that's going to work out. So there's, there's balance there too, which is, it's a lot of fun, but for me, I'm, I'm more of a high level outside the box, you know, 30,000 foot person. I'm, I'm not a get down in the weeds details person all the time. Um, 
And I think that's been really, really good for our organization to kind of think about like, what's the next step in that balancing act? So that's, that's kind of where the balance comes in at. I wanted to linger on this for a little bit and go from like 10,000 feet to 100 feet. And yeah. maybe we took one day of your week, like last week. Could yeah. you talk about what it, what was it made of? Like specifically, what are the activities that take up your day? Man, every day is different. Um, so like I, I take any day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So like one day last week, I was having breakfast with the CEO of a hospital here in the region talking about, you know, they need orthopedic coverage and orthopedic help. And, you know, that same day I'm I'm talking about negotiating to buy a practice. And then, um, you know, later that same day, I'm looking at like, how do we open up our imaging or MRI scanners to get more throughput? Because, you know, we're, we're got volume, you know, that comes through our door that we can't get into our own scanners. And, and then I'm, you know, working on uh, contracting negotiation with one of the big, the big payers, one of the BUCAs, the Blue Cross United Cigna Aetna or, or HealthLink or Humana. I'm working on a contract negotiation with them and, and like, you know, they're just powered us and trying to cut our rates all the time. So, uh, so there's that, that's the day, right? It goes all the way from expanding our practice to buying a practice to negotiation with a payer to all sorts of stuff. And uh, the variety is great for me, right? Like I'm somebody who thrives off variety and autonomy and, um, it's awesome. But, uh, you know, unfortunately there's only so many things that can get accomplished in a day. Um, you know, I'd, I'd work 24 hours a day if my wife would let me, but, uh, I, I, I love my, my job and the opportunity here, you know, to, to work towards a destination. I love it. And I think one of the challenges for me, I also thrive on having diversity, but there is a challenge, uh, to find time to do focused work. Oh, yeah. I'm kind of reading books like I wake up at 5 a.m. or like work on weekends, work on Saturday or like work nights. Yep. You have a formula that works for you to do like, I don't know, a block, a chunk of focused work of a couple of hours or more. Yeah, I'm still trying to learn that myself. Um, what, what I've been working on now is time blocking, you know, kind of blocking 15 to 30 minutes for a project or a, you know, deep thought on something and then moving it to the side. Um, you know, one of my biggest headaches that I had, you know, throughout my entire career is the, the pen and paper, right? You get the pen and paper and you write it all down and then where does it go? It sits on your desk or gets lost in a stack of other pen and paper stuff. So I've recently moved to a lot of digital now where I can block stuff digitally or, have it all in one shared file where I can look at everything and categorize it and order it and rank and file it. It still doesn't eliminate the whole, how do you prioritize a project or, or something that comes up because there's just so many things that, you know, they can happen and, and there's no way of knowing when it's going to happen, what's going to happen, all of those things. So I'm still trying to figure it out. If, if there's a magic recipe out there somebody knows about like man i'd love for them to send it to me because i i still to this day am, am trying to think through like prioritization on you know we've got this going on and then oh, this gets added all of a sudden so that fire is burning hotter than this fire and this kind of creeps off the burner and and then you're like oh let's bring it back to the burner and then another thing pops up so there's there's all these different kind of flashpoints that happen in your your daily life and i'm sure you experience it too where you're like Okay, how do I how do I manage through those aspects? There is a book that really had an impact on me, and I highly recommend. And I'll send you the link. It's called uh, "The One Thing." Okay, and great. The idea is like how to pick one thing for five years, one thing for the next week, uh, one thing for a day, and essentially, yeah. like it gives focus and everything else. Yes, it might happen. It might not happen, but at least one thing gets accomplished. So I'm trying to implement this uh in my life and this is the book i yeah. gave out the most to people and they talked about the most so i'm happy <laughs> to share yeah. with you how's, how's it working in your life with the implementing it um i have a like a notion board uh, where i have one thing for each area of my life that i'm working towards okay 
Uh, and then this is like on a bigger scale of things. And it yeah. helps me to reflect like, what is the goal? Because you forget, uh, and this is kind of reflecting every week. Am I, have I been working on this this week? And then every day, uh, like, you know, this analogy with pebbles and sand, mm -hmm. uh, like the gloss, if you fill it yeah. with sand at first, you cannot fit in pebbles. But if yeah. you start with bigger pebbles, sand will still fit in. So this is the model I'm trying to do with my day where, okay, I have to do those like one, those one or two things today and that's it. Yeah. And I try to be very conservative and I'm still learning and practicing with my team how to do it, but it's better <laughs> than trying just to flow because then you get things only that you have on the calendar or other people kind of put on you versus doing things that I want to do or I want to work on. Yeah, for sure. For sure. No, that's great. I'd love to look at that book. And it's short and you can read to it, listen to it. And it's not like, um, you know, some books, they are more like preaching and they're not based on science or they're telling things that are not real. This is an evidence-based book. It's short, condensed with a lot of practical things beyond just this idea of one thing. So happy to share. And I'm glad you've asked. But I wanted to come back to your work. So uh, you're working at a very successful organization. The Surgical Center at COG was recognized as the seventh best uh, amb ambulatory surgery center in the U.S. So what are the three most important lessons or insights our listeners and viewers can take from your experience to get there? Yeah, well, you know, that was a, uh, a very fortunate thing for us to receive such high recognition from, from Newsweek. Um, you know, our surgery center has been kind of our, our crown jewel in our organization. Uh, it's been around since 2008 when we founded our business. And I think, you know, the big things that we have taken away from that is, you know, it's, it's quality over quantity, right? Like you've got to absolutely do the best job possible for every patient or consumer or customer, you know, what, whatever you want to categorize them as that walks in the door. You know, for us, it's it's not necessarily a high volume thing like we don't operate on every patient we see um, by no means and in fact like our uh, they track what's called surgical conversion rate uh, which is kind of your new patients established patients to the number of surgeries you do we're we're very very conservative we want to be conservative because you know surgery is a big deal right like making that decision it's tough and like you know, there's absolutely some things where we're like okay you broke your arm yeah, that, that could be an open reduction or that could be, you know, closed, but like we may end up having surgery. You just, we don't know, or somebody, you know, broke their femur or they broke their hip or something like those are the cases where you're like, yeah, that's going to happen. But when it comes to like, you know, I've had arthritis or I've had, you know, this terrible pain or whatever going on for, for months or for years, that's still a big decision. Making that leap, that commitment from like, ouch to surgery to better is it's a big deal. So like we want to take our time and we want to make sure we go about that the right way. So it's a quality thing, not a quantity thing. Uh, I would say that's one of the big things. And then the other thing is, you know, I think one of the big lessons we've learned is you've got to, you've got to bring in the talent and the people, the resources to adequately address the needs of your, your patient population you're serving. So we have a lot of people who work in our surgery center that work on quality or nurse navigation, where we assign somebody to every single patient when they walk in the door. So they, they have a person to talk to, you know, if, if I'm a patient of ours and I walk in, you know, I could have one of our nurse navigators, Megan or Julie or whomever, um, work with me one-on-one. -on -one. Hmm. And they get my phone number, they call me, they check on me. Uh, we have a digital engagement solution they use that has therapy built into it and all of your instructions and your exercises. And like, you just, you've got to make sure that there's, you know, the right people, right places, right time, always being available to commit to, you know, our, our mission, which is, you know, moving people forward to get back to their lives. And then, you know, I would say the last thing is it, it really comes down to just doing the right thing. You know, all of those things stack up, right? Like you got to get the right people. It's all about quality, but really it comes down to the simple, like just do the right thing. Just take care of people. Just, you know, for us doing the right thing looks like many different things. So, you know, 
if, if we're going to do a surgery on somebody and we have a fixed reimbursement case from a, a federal payer, like a Medicare, TRICARE, or somebody like that, and we have implants that are going to cost more money than what we're going to get paid on the case, we're still going to do it because it's the right thing to do for our patients. Like, you know, it's not a zero sum game. You know, our group's been around since 1965 and the reputation and quality that we stand for is, is phenomenally high. Um, and I think a lot of that stems from doing the right thing. Like we just believe in taking care of people. Like they're not a number, they're a person. So if you do the right thing for everybody, you know, we, we're going to continue to be in business. We're going to continue to do well. Um, and I think that like we do so well off of word of mouth and how well we take care of people. We don't spend hardly any money on marketing. We don't have to, you know, because when they see the reputation, the quality, what gets delivered, how people are taken care of, it, it's really incredible, right? So that's why we have like a five-star review on Google with 5,000 plus reviews. That's why we have a lot of the things we do. That's why we got the Newsweek Award because we we continually to deliver on doing the right thing for our patients at every step that we take in their in their care. And I appreciate you sharing the background and uh, like additional foundational principles that you use in your work for organizations or for leaders who come to struggling organizations where you don't own your buildings, where you don't have perfect yeah. staff, where like the workflow is not ideal and where reimbursements are not keeping up with um, the cost of providing that level of quality. Yeah. What advice can they take from your experience to turn things around? You know, I think that's a great question. So, um, I haven't always worked at places that have all those things, right? So <laughs> I think what it what do you do is you you start at square one. Like, why are we here? What is our mission? What are our goals? And the people we're taking care of, what are their goals? And how do we align with them to make sure that we can deliver? So that seems like really easy. You say it, right? Like way, way easier said than done. But just start start with the numbers. Like, what? How are things stacking up? Where are we at on staffing? How how long does it take to get somebody in the door? You know, what is our efficiency metrics? What are our KPIs? It doesn't depend on it. It doesn't matter what business you're running. You have to look at the numbers and say, okay, I'm running a smoothie business selling things in a drive-through. Well, if my order time takes me 10 minutes and it takes me 10 minutes to make a smoothie, I shouldn't be running a drive through. You know, that, that's a sit down smoothie place all of a sudden. So you got to look at the efficiency and the KPIs to try to deliver where where your opportunities are. And, you know, I think for us, one of the things that we're looking at is, you know, quite honestly, as an organization, it takes quite a while for somebody to get in the door to see us because we only have a limited number of doctors We've got a gigantic catchment area of patients. So our biggest things we're trying to address are how do we improve our access so we can get more people in the door to be taken care of sooner to where they can get their, their injuries, their ailments, their issues addressed. Because if people are waiting, you know, that's not good. I don't want to wait. I can order a pizza on my phone and it can be delivered here to work in less than 30 minutes. Why can't I do that with my orthopedic care? Why can't I do that with my health care in general? Well, the system says you can't. But that's not really true. That's not true. Why don't we why don't we come up with something where we can do that better? You know, I think our our world where people want things addressed immediately, you got to meet people where they are, right? Now there's some things you cannot do immediately. Like if we're going to do surgery on you, it, it it's dependent on so many variables, right? There's there's the staff, there's the anesthesia, there's the room, there's the all these other the insurance companies. You know, the insurance companies get in the way of blocking us there. So like there's all these different obstacles that pop up where we have to address each one of those categorically. What I would say on top of that is like if you're a new leader coming into a brand new business, start start at square one, like. Where, where's the numbers? Where's the data? Where's the finances? Where's the information? Find all your info before you start making some assumptions, because what you may think is happening might be the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, you may think you need to increase your 
throughput or product production on one thing in your business. And it's the complete opposite of that. You need to work on a totally different subset of issues. So I think that's where, you know, a lot of people make the mistake of walking in the door and, and they come in with a preconceived notion or, or disposition or, you know, some kind of thought or theory on like, we need to do this. Well, you don't really know. You don't know what you need to do until you, until you start dissecting everything one little one little thing at a time and just figuring out like, okay. And then there's a lot of variables that are very codependent. So if I address this, this gets addressed. Or if I address that, it has this reciprocal effect. So, you know, it's kind of, you know, they say matters never created or destroyed, really. So it's the same thing in your business. You don't really ever know until you pull one string what that string is attached to sometimes. So, and I think that's where it's kind of fun thinking through that process, but it's also a very serious process because, you know, there's, there's reciprocal things that happen all over. You know, you, you could do something and then all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, why did that efficiency go down? Well, you added this or you took this away. So you, you've got to really be thoughtful and kind of think about like all of the little things that add up to big things. Very cool. And I could ask you tons more questions about the model that you're describing, that you're building in your mind based on data and then testing assumptions. I love this. I'm passionate about like building businesses and startup businesses, but I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about technology and software. As I represent a software company, Kepler Team, it's always great to learn from organizations like yours. What are the main challenges you face with your current technology infrastructure or software solutions. And then if you did a recent implementation of new technology to address some of those things you talked about, uh, what went well and what didn't meet your expectations? Yeah, so kind of starting at the beginning, addressing like where we're at as a, a software or technology purchaser or user, right? So we're in the healthcare space. so. Everything we do revolves around a practice management system or a PM, and then also an electronic health record or an EHR. Um, and very unapologetically, all of those vendors suck. None of them are good. Uh, they all have one thing going for them in one side of the house or one thing going on the other side. So there's no you know, all-in solution that gets an A plus in our market. And, and like, you could look at all of the different stuff out there, you know, Gartner or class or all these different rankings, right? I think all those are bogus because when you, when you start looking at like a, an EHR company, all of them are going to get a C at, but at best, like it, it doesn't matter. They could say, we're really, really good. Well, how good, how good are you? How easy do you make my life by me giving you a ton of money? And if you don't make my life easier by me giving you a ton of money, you get a C, like that's the best grade you're going to get. So I, I'm I'm a huge proponent of using tech. I'm also a huge proponent of holding tech accountable because there's a lot of things that get promised, they go undelivered. And there's so many things, like we talked at the beginning, there's so many other projects that, that kind of creep up where you're like, you forget to hold your tech vendor, partner, you know, service provider, whatever accountable for what they've promised. Um, on top of that, you know, we live in a space in the healthcare world where there's just so many things that are necessary to run a practice today due to government regulation that the, the cost hardship that gets created from that is really kind of unacceptable. So, you know, you think about like, okay, we're going to put in a brand new EHR in the next year. Okay, well, that's going to be anywhere from $500,000 to a million dollars, depending on your size, who knows? And then you're going to pay a monthly fee, a software fee, you know, you're just going to get feed to death, right? Like death by a thousand cuts on fees. And then your Medicare reimbursement goes down because why not? They just always cut it because there's, they can. Um, so like where, where does the, where does the, you know, resolution come with that and how does that work? Right? Like, does it even make any sense to put in a brand new EHR or to buy a nice EHR or one that potentially makes you more efficient or helps you see more patients or helps your billing process? Maybe you just use the same old lame piece of crap one you have already and just keep it because it's cheap, not better. And I think that's where a lot of small 
businesses like ours, they struggle because there's a lot of tech that's required to meet the needs of all of the um, bureaucracy that's thrown on practices. So I, I would say to that though, um, you still got to do it. Unfortunately, you still got to bite the bullet, put the tech in, try to deliver in, in a meaningful way. You know, I'm very serious when it comes to actually vetting out these solutions. Like I was saying, we picked a, a digital engagement solution in our surgery center um, that helps navigate patients throughout their entire care continuum. We don't just use it at the surgery center, though. We use it at our, the hospital we operate at. We use it for every patient we see that has surgery because surgery is a big deal, like we talked about. And having all those extra resources available to you at any point in time means something. You don't want to get home and forget, what did they say? So we, we want to be able to give you all of those resources. And we also don't want it to be one of those things where like you get home and you go, okay, we better just call the ER or go to the ER because we forgot. Well, no, don't do that. That's really bad. Like you don't know what's sitting in the ER. Like, especially during COVID, you had no idea what the ER looked like here. So I think there's, there's that where you have to deliver value, but that comes at cost. So again, where's the reimbursement for it, right? You know, one of the most recent tech solutions we did was we put in a brand new HRIS system. We got rid of our old system. It was clunky. Every little thing we added on cost, cost money, not saying it doesn't in the new system, um, but it just looks, feels, works better. The, the user interface and the user experience, the UI and the UX are significantly better. It's so, it's so easy for anybody to use it. Like it has all of our insurance information loaded on it. So it becomes a virtual insurance card when they go to the doctor. Um, super unique. It interfaces, you know, with our 401k vendor. It, it interfaces with our carriers to send benefits back and forth. It also has a learning, learning management system built into it. So we can actually do some training through it as well and track that for their performance evals. Like there's a lot of features that are built into this that make it better than what we did have. And honestly, it, it was cheaper. Like mm -hmm. we were paying for one of those, you know, big, big box store HR systems. I won't say the name of it. Uh, mm -hmm. We were paying for that and like their support sucked and they didn't really care. They had a breach of data information and a couple paychecks got breached and pushed to another account. There's no accountability. They just said it was our fault. We're like, how the hell is that even possible? So we just said, you know what, enough of this. Like you, you guys are so big, you don't care about a small customer. Let's go to a smaller startup that that's built a solution that works well. And like any little customization or feature we've added or asked for that's been built. That they they're very client friendly, very consumer driven. They they just work. You know, like anything you've thought of adding to your HR system, they'll add it or they'll do it. Like they've got a tech integration for if your workforce is at home, you can auto ship technology, you know, computers, mice, keyboards, whatever to their house. Um, they've got an onboarding, you know, cloud suite built into it. They've got the LMS. They've got all these things that just add value for us. And then they've got a what's, uh, what's the name of that startup? Let's highlight them. Yeah. So it's called Rippling. Um mm -hmm. It works really, really slick. You know, I don't know that many people are using it like in the healthcare space. A lot of the people in the healthcare space use like a, a Paycom or UKG or Paychex or one of the big vendors because people don't know any better and they don't spend the time to look at this because it's, that's when you think about the project list, the priority list, that's not one in the top for, for people in my role. Like we're not looking at that. But when we looked at it, we found, you know, another two grand worth of savings a month and it made life easier for my staff and I didn't have to go buy another system for something else. So why not? That's an easy, that's an easy flip of the switch. You know, my HR director is like, I want to switch from this to something new. Are you okay if I investigate it? Go for it. That's your area, right? I'm, I'm not the subject matter expert in that. If you find something you like, let's do it. You know, she took some time, went through some demos. I sat in on a couple of them and she's like, this is the one I want. Perfect. Let's try it. What's the worst that happens? We fail, but then we pick something different. Like, I think that's the big thing too, is like, get out of this like habit of thinking, you know, you're scared to fail. It's okay. Fail fast, fail hard, move on. Like stuff happens. Nothing's perfect. Very cool. So I'm glad you were able to find a vendor that is beyond your C grade. 
<laughs> yeah, they're they're probably. I don't want to get. I don't want to go too high. They're probably like a B plus. May, okay. maybe, maybe teetering on A minus. But like, I'm super picky. You don't want me to grade tech solutions. Like, I, I I'm like a movie critic, but with these tech solutions, like it, it's like always falling down the row on Rotten Tomatoes. So. But thank you. Thank you for sharing the story. One uh, last question on uh, like software implementations and technology is like, do you rely on the vendor to do all the integration work? Do you have your own in-house team? Do you have a balance? Like how does that work in your organization? It depends. It depends on what it is, what we're trying to integrate it with and um, you know, what, what their capabilities are and who they're working with and how interoperability actually works on their side. So like, you know, the patient engagement solution we use called Force Therapeutics, they use a big national firm, Redox, to do all of their integrations, and they're pretty solid. Like, you're not going to find many issues with that from what we've seen. So that was the both sides, though, where like our IT manager was able to work with them directly and set up the feeds, you know, back and forth. The HR system, we don't have it integrated with anything yet. Um, we're, we're actually building out a brand new accounting software as well, and we mm -hmm. will be integrating it with that. So that'll be our first big integration with the HR system to see how that works out. So far, you know, I, I don't have any concern about that. You know, we're working with Sage Intact on our accounting system and, and Rippling. Sage is so big, like I don't, I don't think they're going to have any problems integrating with anything. Um, <clears throat> even when we we're talking to Sage about like, hey, this is what we're doing. This is the vendor we're picking for HR. They're like, yep, no problem. We don't care. Hmm. No, they're they're confident. Like they are like, we don't care. We can work with it. Okay, cool. You can pull all our payroll in and automatically do financials. Yeah, yeah, we're not worried. Sweet. So I, I think that's like a, you know, confidence in that space honestly means something to me. I, I have found the groups that are very, very confident about what they can work with they actually tend to deliver more than the groups that are like, well, we'll have to go look at this. And is it in our playbook? And do we have this? And do we have that? And I'm like, oh God, you're already going to be a problem. Like, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to work with you because I'm going to babysit you. Like you should know how your tech works and how it integrates. I don't have to know that. So I don't know, maybe that's something you found or not found in your space uh, as well. But it seems like the the big companies that are, you know, driven by this big box. If it doesn't fit in this box, we don't integrate with it. They're just like so hard to work with, you know, that it it's almost not even worth it. And then the smaller companies or the more agile companies, they're they're like, yep, no problem. Don't care. We're ready to go. I think those big companies actually create space for organizations like Kepler. Yeah. <laughs> because we typically come in and we serve as a team that deals with a big company and with a customer product, mm -hmm. either augmenting the customer team or being the customer team for some organizations. And then uh, our customers get the same peace of mind, regardless of um, like the approach of the bigger organization. Yeah, that's, that's great. How well you proposition. So, but I'm glad you're highlighting this challenge because that's the market. <laughs> that yeah, we're it's real. I mean, it's a problem. Out. Yeah. Very cool. So let's uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about the state of healthcare. So you've spoken passionately about the violation of antitrust laws within the healthcare system, about this United Healthcare being 9% of the total spend on uh, healthcare uh, GDP in the US. What drives you to be so vocal and passionate about these issues in healthcare? Well, I think it's just, um, you know, for one, I, I would call it, uh, this is a stolen term, not my own, but I would call it sick care, not healthcare. Our system is very fundamentally broken. We, um, I think, you know, the biggest thing that drives me to probably be outspoken about it is that somebody has to be, you know, and I think it's happening more, right? Like there's significantly more pressure from the American public and American employers to hold people accountable. You know, when the CAA got passed nationally, You've already seen employers come out and sue their own insurance companies that they're using about not disclosing costs or what are the admin fees or all of the other information related to their health plan. That's going to be more common. 
honestly. Like people are sick of it. You know, we we live in this world now where the two or three U.S. Um, biggest lobbying associations in the country are the American Hospital Association, Big Pharma, and insurance companies. Tell me how that makes any sense. Like, what's wrong with us? Why, why are we in a position where we're allowing the people that are profiteering off of us to continue to profiteer? Like, and you you look at like, there's other crusaders that are out there, like a, an Eric Bricker with, you know, healthcare, uh, A, healthcare to Z, or, um, you know, there's the Nomi Health doc guys that are out there. There's, there's, this is not new. Like pe people are getting to the point where they are just, sick and tired of listening to the same old song and dance forever and not actually getting anything for their dollar. Like it's not uncommon to see our patients have a $10,000 deductible and they don't know why. Well, the reason why is because the, the biggest companies in the country are taking your premium dollar and denying care and just padding their, their books with it. And they're just saying, you know what? forget it. Like we're going to deny that anyways, because it's a payer policy. How the hell do you know what a payer policy is? Like, how, how are you to say insurance company that you know what clinically is beneficial for a patient? You don't know. Tell me the last time you saw that patient did an HMP on them. You haven't, you don't know. So I think that's where like, as, as an industry, we have really got to step up. Like it's broken. People, people don't really quite understand how fundamentally messed up it is. Like, you know, there's recent studies in the last four to five years. And I don't even know what the percentage was during COVID. I, I reckon it'd be higher. But the GDP, the entire gross domestic product of our entire U.S. economy, 20% of it was spent on health care. One fifth. That is astronomical to me. That makes no sense. And where is it going, right? Like, let's say it's 20%. Let's all agree it's that. That's it. That's the fact, right? Where's it going? Because it's not going in the in the pockets of those people providing care. It's not going to the nurses, the doctors, the physician assistants, the anesthesiologists. It's not happening. It's going to pad the pockets, big pharma, the insurance companies, everybody else out there. You, you look at like, for example, like Abby when they had their Humira, you know, it's a $200 billion drug. And then it went generic and, you know, there's um, biosimilars that are going to come out and Abby's just going to completely scrap Humira and move on to another drug because they're not going to make the money on it anymore because the patent ran out. So like you're, you're, we're playing with a loaded deck that's completely against us. And, you know, if you're, if you're an employer like us, we're a self-funded employer, we pay all of our own claims, right? We work through a captive but we don't have like one of the big insurance companies as our as our payer. We don't have a Blue Cross, United, a Cigna, HealthLink, or whatever. We're a self-funded group. We work with a TPA, pay all of our own claims. Administratively, that's a hell of a lot more work. But it is a hell of a lot cheaper than working with one of the big five. You know, working with them is just awful. You're not in a position to make any changes. You have no power. You can't control your cost. You can't even help your employees. Like I will tell you, we have one of the craziest insurance plans for our own employees in the country, right? Like, and not to plug, but like we're hiring in our market. We have no copay, no deductible. Hmm. An employee can go see anybody at one of our in-network providers and pay zero. Zero. And we're not saying their premiums are like a thousand dollars a month either like an individual premium on our health plan is like 150 bucks. So yeah. your entire cost for the year, 150 times 12. Whereas I got patients walking in the door, they got $10,000 deductible and out-of-pocket max of $15,000. My, my employees are nowhere near that. I mean, it's a significant benefit. And, you know, I think that we as an American public, like everyone could move to the plan I have. It's not hard. You, you got to work at it to set it up, but you got to invest the time. And you think about all the projects you have on your plate, right? Like I got this, 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 this. This is probably the number one one, like taking care of your people and making sure your employees have avail availability to get good health care at a reasonable price is going to be what sets employers aside from each other. 
And we can't continue just to pad the pockets of those that are profiteering off the back of the system. So, you know, what's the statistic? 20% of the GDP, right, on healthcare. 9% of the GDP goes through United Healthcare, Optum, or SCA. How does that make sense? That's almost half. That's almost half of the healthcare dollar goes through one single payer. They're the largest employer of doctors in the world. 40,000 plus physicians work for Optum. Wow. How do we not have a conflict of interest here? <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me. Do their own doctors have to go through their own pre-authorization process? I don't know that answer. Don't. I'm, I'm just curious. I'm asking questions, right? Like, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. I think people are scared of that because they're like, well, if we ask a question, then this is going to happen or that's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen. We need to ask, though. People need to be held accountable at the top because there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that's messed up. We, we've got to get to a point where, like, we can talk about this. So, you know, it's not like I'm trying to call people out, but we got to have something something's got to happen. The pendulum's got to swing back, right? Like we can't be in a position where physician pay cuts are going to happen again from Medicare because what, what happens with that, right, is it's compounding. So think about like all of our commercial insurance contracts as a company are based off of Medicare. So it's a percent of Medicare one way or the other, right? Well, that's been great for the insurance companies because for the last 20 years, Medicare has just cut their rates. Well, what does that happen to the commercial reimbursement? They've just cut their rates. But has your premium ever went down on your insurance? Nope, sure hasn't. Where's the dollar going? You got to follow the money, right? Like it's going somewhere, not coming to me. I'm not the one benefiting from the dollar. I'm not the one getting your increased premium. So, you know, I, I don't know that it's like where we have to go out and move to a single payer system. I, I wouldn't condone that. I don't think that's great for our, for our people in our country. But I do think we need to move to some sort of system where there's some regulation put on these insurance companies. And, you know, like most of them, here's what's freaking ironic. Most of them are not for profits by tax status. How does that make sense? That's messed up, man. <laughs> like I, the, I run a for-profit business. I pay taxes. We pay significant taxes. My doctors pay significant taxes, but yet they're not for profits. What, under what freaking government does that make any sense at all? You know, you've got them turning in multi-billion dollar profits. You know, the last time we turned in a multi-billion dollar profit here? Never. It won't happen. It can't happen. I, I love the narrative that you're sharing, but I'm also always curious about uh, solutions. Like what the solution for that could be and who are those we and I don't mean like some wonderful people upstairs who will come and be benevolent and kind of solve the problem from the yeah. point of view of civil society and organizations like yours and employers what are the things that can be done today or what should be done today to start shift the battle yeah. in the other direction I think every employer if you're not self-funded as an employer, you need to look at that. And seriously, take your time, pull back the curtains, ask for the data. All, all of this full circle just keeps coming to data, right? Ask for the data, ask for the claims, ask for the admin fees, ask for every little thing you can about your health plan to get the information. And if you believe you're in a position where you can make a leap and be self-funded, which most, most employers that are over 50 to 100 people can do it. it it's not that hard, honestly. Um, there's a lot of upfront you know, legwork that goes into it, but cost-wise, you're going to pay yourself off in, in less than a year. So make the leap, go to self-funded. And then on top of that, work with a local or well-reputable TPA or broker to make that happen. So you've, you've got to just throw it all aside and say, okay, my relationship with Sid Broker, who always pushes a level funded Blue Cross plan down my throat, sorry, doesn't matter. We're not, sorry, Igor, we're not going to play golf every day from now on. I'm going to have to entertain doing something different. Like you got, you got to rip the bandaid off. 
you've got to say, okay, as an employer, my duty, my fiduciary duty is to my employees and my business. How do I do that? Look at your data. And if you don't know how to look at it, hire somebody, spend the cash, hire somebody who can help you examine your data to figure out what direction to go in. The next thing is, is the American public, right? Ask for a cash discount. Sometimes it's cheaper to go outside of your insurance plan than it is to, to do it via, or sometimes it's cheaper to do cash than it is to use your insurance. You know, like it's okay to do that. Thinking, thinking that you're always going to get the best price with your insurance is not true. So you, you need to, you need to make yourself a well-informed consumer, right? And then on top of that, like do your own research, independent research on doctors you're going to see, see like, see what their charges are. Hospitals, it's mandatory for them to disclose price transparency. Google that. There's there's people out there that have open marketplace stuff, though. MD Save, Turquoise. There's a lot of vendors that have developed these open marketplace solutions where you can go and you can price a total joint, a surgery, an MRI, all these different things in the marketplace. Do it. Like, just shop around. See what's out there. And then I would say nine times out of 10, pursuing things at a private practice shop versus an employed shop or a hospital versus an ASC, you're going to see the cost savings from an ASC are two to a three to one on an HOPD or a hospital. You're going to see that a private practice is going to be significantly more valuable from that standpoint as well. Like, our prices are not going to be the same that they're going to be at the hospital-based clinic or the academic-based clinic or all those things. We've got skin in the game. It's in our best interest to be really good stewards of your dollar. Like we are the ones who are going to be standing there at the end of the day going, okay, we're responsible for this care. Like let's do it in a way that's meaningful. So I think those are the big things as a consumer shop around. And then if you're an employer, get serious, like look at your health plan. It, it takes work but it's work well worth doing. Uh, last question. Yeah. Uh, what excites you the most about the next 12 months? Oof, that's a great question. Man, I think for me, it's just the infinite opportunity to do better. That That's what excites me the most, right? It's like, you know, our business has been around for a long time, but there's always ways to improve. You know, there's always ways to do better, to deliver more value. So it's it's that that opportunity to just roll your sleeves up and say, okay, we've done it this way. Can we do it better? So, and you know, I work with a, a group of 26 physicians and working with them is not easy, but honest to God, like their, their hearts in, are in the right place. They just want to take care of patients and they want to do a good job. So like, making improvements towards doing that is so easy because they're all in it. Like they're like, yes, whatever we need to do to do a better job for our patients, let's do it. So I think if you can align um, values and vision internally and head in a direction that increases, you know, your deliverable for your consumer, that's going to be huge. So it you've got to build the culture to get there. Um, that's something we're working on is, you know, delivering, you know, excellent care every step in a patient's care continuum. And, you know, we're, we're trying to keep iterating to go the next mile to make it like we just put in a lab on a week ago to where we can make it easier for patients when they come here. Like, okay, you come see us, you need surgery. You got to have labs drawn. Guess what? The lab's right here. You don't got to go anywhere else. Oh, we got a pharmacy too. You can get that too. Oh, you need a brace. We got that. Oh, you need an MRI. We got that too. Like we're trying to say, what are the things in your care journey that you will need? And how can we make those better, more affordable, more accessible for you along that journey? Because this stuff's not easy and it's your freaking benefit plan is complicated. People don't even know what their insurance plan even says most of the time. So like just providing those little you know, insightful steps along each way to make sure everybody has what they need. That's a huge, 
huge market driver for us. Like we're just, we're very transparent along the whole process too. Like if we don't think something's going to work, we're not going to recommend it. Even if it makes a lot of money, we're still not going to recommend it because it might not work for you. So it, it's all about delivering the value to the customer, the client, the patient, and, and doing the right thing, like we talked about. Um, and then just capitalizing on opportunities, just incrementally improving over and over and over and over. Very cool. Thank you so much for uh, this great conversation. Yeah, thank you so much. This was great. And that's a wrap on today's episode of the Health Tech Crew podcast. Heartfelt thank you to Andrew Lovewell for joining us and sharing your wealth of knowledge and balancing multiple roles, driving innovation in orthopedics and speaking candidly on the state of healthcare. Andrew, your insights are a masterclass for anyone navigating the complex healthcare landscape. To our listeners, thank you for being a part of this journey with us. Your curiosity and encouragement are the fuel that keeps this podcast running. And of course, a special thanks to Kepler team for their incredible support. If you are in the health tech sector and you are looking for HR integrations done right, Kepler is your go-to team. They're an unsung tech heroes that make episodes like this one a reality. So until our next episode, stay curious, stay innovative, and let's keep pushing the healthcare envelope. See you next time.